Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Munson with Forge. And the topic of today's webinar, which is hopefully the one that you want to be on, is strategies for improving trans pol police relations. We're really excited that you've joined us today. And we have a really good 90 minutes worth of topic um, with Jason Terry as our, our primary presenter today. He's going to introduce himself in a, a few more minutes. Um, but I wanted to get some of the, the welcoming and housekeeping items out of the way first um, before we devote the rest of the time to talking about trans police relations. So again, I'm really glad that you're here. And um, we've got a really full uh, next hour and a half. So a couple of housekeeping items. One of the things that um, many of you have seen if you've been on one of our webinars or in-person trainings has been this slide with this wonderfully uh, pink-haired person on it. So I really encourage you to take care of yourself. I know that a lot of us work with, with trauma survivors every day, and it can be really draining to hear some of the, the things that we talk about. So um, know a couple of things that will help you be able to take care of yourself, which is that we'll record this session, so you'll be able to uh, listen to it later if you'd like to listen to it later. We'll be sending out PowerPoints um, as well as that recorded um, archive link tomorrow. So you'll have all the information that you can can look at it again later if you'd like, or look at it fresh later if you'd like. We'll be asking you to uh, engage with us in a couple of different ways. One is through the question box. So um, hopefully most of you can see that question box. It looks like what's on your screen right now. And I'm wondering if folks could um, just make sure that you can find it by typing in maybe um, what temperature it is um, in your city right now. Let's just give a couple of minutes to make sure that people can see how cold or warm it is. So it looks like it's cold in a lot of places in the country right now. And too warm for a couple of people. Excellent. So it looks like a lot of you have found that. So that is the place where you can ask questions, both um, technical questions as well as questions for Jason or for, for me later on. Um, we have uh, Katie Taylor who's going to be fielding some of those questions and helping distribute them later on in the webinar. The other way that we'd like you to interact with us is through a poll. We have one poll today. It's very self-explanatory. You'll see a screen very much like this, and you just click on the answer that you'd like to, to respond with. Many of you have also seen this slide, but um, we wanted to make sure that you knew um, what Forge has to offer you as service providers and what we have to offer for your clients. Um, who may be transgender and um, survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, or hate-related um, crimes. So let me start on the right side of the screen with support that we can offer for uh, transgender survivors. We do have um, a listserv that's available for folks 24-7, since a lot of times trans survivors feel really isolated and really alone. And it's a place where people can reach out um, any time of the day or night. We also have a really large referral database, which is both useful for transgender survivors as well as for service providers who are providing services to those trans survivors. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have access to more trans knowledgeable providers in somebody's area. So we can definitely hook the survivor up themselves or you up with uh, some other providers in your area that may offer some additional support. We offer uh, two kind of direct services. One is a Writing to Heal program, which we offer online. It's sporadic. It's not uh, a fixed schedule every year, but it's a way for survivors who are trans who may not be able to access services locally to access um, trauma-based, trauma-informed work online in a really good, fun, interactive way that's engaging and, and healing for them. The other thing that we offer for transgender survivors is um, a fairly new project called the Esbabo Project. And it's a photographic and narrative uh, project that helps people take their power back. And you won't see any of the images today, but if you've been on other webinars, you've definitely seen some of those images in our trainings. So let me talk a little bit about the training and technical assistance that we can um, provide. We do a great deal of one-on-one -on -one support with providers and agencies and individuals. So you can reach out to us through email or through phone, and we are more than happy to try to help you figure out um, a challenge that you might be facing or a question that you might have. And sometimes those questions are really um, a fairly simple answer, like a, a one-time interaction. And sometimes we work with, with folks for a really long time to figure out good solutions for the long term. 
We offer webinars like this. They're almost every month. We have a really large archive of, of past recorded webinars that we encourage you to look at. And I wanted to, to point out a couple of them that uh, you may be interested in since you're on this webinar. So a couple of them that you might be particularly interested in are um, the Community Cares Mobilizing After a High Profile Crime webinar. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a webinar about how communities can respond uh, respectfully and engagingly between uh, pro community members, trans community members, and providers or concerned citizens in their area. A second webinar that I wanted to highlight was um, Anti-Trans Violence in Prison. And that was a webinar we did around a year ago with Chris Daly from Just Detention International. And it was a really high-paced, fast-paced webinar. And again, really uh, you know, tangentially related to the topic today. A third one that I'd like to highlight is the Stocking webinar. Again, this was around a year ago. Uh, we partnered with the Stocking Resource Center, and Rebecca Drakey was our guest speaker that day. And that was um, a webinar that offered content on something that we don't often hear about or talk about, which is stocking. And then the fourth and last one that I wanted to just highlight for you today is the Violence Against Women Act Non-Discrimination Conditions webinar, which we did in conjunction with the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs. So I encourage you to look at any of those four or, or the other 30 or so that are, are available on our website. We do offer trainings around the country. So um, we're fortunate to be able to go places and do in-person trainings as well as do specific online trainings for agencies who request. So that's a, a fun way for us to engage in a little bit more personal way. And the last thing that I wanted to share with you about training and technical assistance that we can offer you are a, a set of publications. We have many of them that are on our website. Um, one that you might be interested in is, is our checklist for creating trans welcoming services, which is kind of an overview, but it, it helps agencies kind of get on board. And another one is just one that has come out recently, and it was a partnership with the National Resource Center um, on Domestic Violence. And it was a, an article that's called Sheltering Trans Women. And we're currently in the process of creating two tandem documents, one for sheltering trans men and one for sheltering gender non-binary uh, folks. So keep an eye out for those two coming up. So that's a little bit about what we can offer you. We are always grateful for the Office on Violence Against Women who makes these webinars possible and makes um, other trainings and, and resources possible for us to share with you. So as we get started, I wanted to let you know a little bit about who is on today's call and then turn things over to Jason, who will tell you a little bit more about himself. So once again, I'm Michael Munson with uh, Forge. I'm Forge's executive director and all-around worker bee. And usually on today's call, we would have um, Forge's other full-time staff member, Larry Cook Daniels. But she's fortunately in Washington, DC right now at a listening session on LGBTQ youth and violence sponsored by the Department of Justice. So she's doing great work out there while, while we're all here together today. So for today, we have um, a relatively new consultant on the line with us, but a longtime collaborator, Katie Taylor, who will be stepping into what Larie's role usually is, which is to help some of those, uh, field some of those technical questions that we have as we go along and to collect the, the questions that you have for Jason at the end. So we're really thrilled that Jason can join us today and share his really outstanding knowledge and experience with us. So Jason, can I turn things over to you? Absolutely, and thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jason Perry, and I have been volunteering with the DC Trans Coalition, which is an all-volunteer grassroots political organization here in Washington for the past five years or so, focusing on anti-violence work. So some, some work around um, prisons, but mostly around police and also violence response. Um, my focus in particular with the police department has been on training and broader reform efforts. And that has included being involved in training over 300 police officers, um, engaging political leaders and high-level officials in the police department, um, making active use of the media, and building a broad coalition in support of our work. Um, some of our efforts in the past year led to the creation of something called the DC Anti-Violence Collaborative, which is aimed at broadening the conversation around LGBTQ violence in DC. Um, 
And our aim there is to make services more accessible to survivors and join forces with multiple local organizations for political change. Uh, by day, I work in international educational exchanges and training, which is almost entirely unrelated to my volunteer work. And I've got an academic background in conflict resolution, which is very directly related to my volunteer work, as you will see. So that's a little about me and us. And before we move on, I want to just get a sense of who else is in the room with us. So a quick poll here. Please just fill it out and just pick what the best fit is for you. So by service providers, I mean those who work with survivors of violence, social workers, etc. cetera. Um, police officials is pretty self-explanatory. If you work for a police department, you are a police official. Um, community activists, that's more those who do policy work, grassroots organizing, that kind of thing, or just general other people. So if you wouldn't mind, just take a couple of seconds to fill that out. Katie, let me know what we found. OK, wow. So 60% of folks are service provider organizers. And that's not surprising. It's great to have you with us. 10% uh, from police officials. That's excellent. Thanks for joining us. 13% uh, community activists. And then 16% um, other folks. Um, if you're an other person, just type a few things in the question box, if you don't mind. And maybe Katie can give us a reminder a little bit later of who you might be. Um, so with that, I'm going to wear on There we go. <laughs> we're just getting our slides to catch up. But we just want to move into our agenda for today. And so first, why are we having this conversation? That's what we're going to cover first. Take a brief historic look at trans police relations. Um, that history is quite long. You're not going to get the whole thing. We're just going to take a quick snapshot of it. Um, then we're going to step about mapping action plans and what you'll need to pursue with your local law enforcement agencies. Um, we'll take a look at some examples from efforts of changing dynamics with police from across the country with a particular look at DC in detail because that's where I'm at and that's where I've done the work. And then we'll take a quick look at creating a supportive legislative framework and where you can find more examples of resources. After that, we'll close out with some questions, some story sharing, and anything else we might have time for. So first, why are we having this conversation? Aside from the obvious that you signed up for it, uh, you've probably heard that trans communities and police agencies don't often get along. There is, in fact, fairly significant uh, amount of data to back that up. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey found that 46% of respondents are reluctant to seek police assistance, while the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs found that 48 of trans hate crime survivors that sought police assistance and experienced police misconduct. Locally here in DC, our own DC Trans Needs Assessment Survey has found that 55% of our respondents were uncomfortable seeking police assistance when they had been victimized. This very present situation has its roots in hundreds of years of legal frameworks and policing practices in the US. Sex and sexuality have been thoroughly policed with laws banning what European settlers referred to as sodomy and other acts and practices deemed immoral or unchristian dating from colonial times. Although some colonies and then later states briefly allowed women to vote immediately after independence, these rights were rapidly curtailed. Of course, after the Cold excuse me, after the Civil War, um, Victorian era model moral laws sprang up across the country alongside Jim Crow laws regulating everything from sexual behavior to what kinds of clothing men and women could legally wear in public. By the time the 20th century rolled around, law enforcement agencies were deeply involved in enforcing all these various discriminatory practices. And as the state's first line of defense against justice movement, found themselves deeply embroiled in conflict and thoroughly mistrusted by right activists of all stripes. Many of these racist, homophobic, sexist, et cetera, laws didn't begin to be repealed until the 1950s and 60s, but their legacy within the culture of police departments lingers. So let's go back 
in time to San Francisco in 1966 with the Compton Cafeteria riot. So a Compton Cafeteria was located in the Tenderloin area of San Francisco and was frequented by trans women and gay youth who were welcome in area bars. The cafeteria was opened late into the night and became a de facto community center and gathering place for these groups. At the same time, cross-dressing was still illegal in San Francisco and patrons were frequently arrested there. One evening, the exact date isn't recorded, um, the manager called the police because he thought the customers were getting a bit rowdy. One trans woman threw her coffee in the police officer's face and violence then ensued. A window was broken, the fight moved outside, newspaper stands were set on fire, and a police car was smashed. Community members protested the cafeteria again the next night, and after that, trans people were banned from ever going back there. Windows were again smashed, more fires, on and on. In the years that followed, though, trans support and advocacy organizations were created in San Francisco. All of this happened three years before the much more famous Stonewall riot in New York City, um, often called the starting point of LGBT movements. And um, that Stonewall environment was also known as being set off by an estimate of police harassment. So that's deep background, and that's your history lesson. I told you to be brief. So let's try to break out a little bit of social science here and look at a context of broader oppression. So up at the top of this box here, you see a big thing called structural violence. That's just a fancy phrase for oppression, which in turn can be construed as racism, transphobia, et cetera. So how structural violence works? What are more groups' needs or rights or privileges uh, privileged above the rights of other groups? The oppressed groups face difficulty meeting their basic human needs, food, shelter, et cetera, and cannot realize their human rights, which are based upon those needs, and also tied to having a voice in meeting their needs and decision-making around that. Structural violence leads to a cycle of secondary violence at the personal, community, and state level. So conflicts tend to escalate between oppressors and oppressed, attacking each other back and forth in sort of a spiral of action and reaction. In the US, trans people usually rank pretty low on various economic and social indicators, generally experiencing higher rates of poverty, lack of access to healthcare resources, low to no income, and difficulty accessing education. These challenges tend to reinforce each other. So, for example, someone bullied at school who drops out will have greater difficulty accessing employment, which leads to both poverty and difficulty accessing health care. Trans people also are more likely to be victims of violence, with trans women of color in particular being more susceptible to hate and violence than any other segment of the broader LGBT population. So what does that all mean when we're working with police departments? A few things here. There are three basic areas. One is that we are seeking institutional transformation. Trans mistrust of police is not something we can just train our way out of. Even when officers are well-meaning, and I've met so many well-meaning officers in, in my experience, the agency as a whole has to be openly committed to doing the right thing. That includes examining policies, procedures, training, and accountability structures. More on that in a bit. Another important element is space for trauma healing and empowerment. Many trans folks have negative views of police, and many say that one negative experience has far more lasting impact than dozens of positive experiences. Each misstep by police will be viewed in the historical and cultural context we just discussed. So what may seem like a minor faux pas on a police perspective may actually be a huge deal from the community perspective. Trans groups that take this work need to make sure that there is plenty of space for community conversation about experience with police, positive and negative, and identifying community solutions and building up community leadership. Finally, all of this is going to be happening within a context of violence response, resolution, and prevention. When incidents of violence occur, particularly hate violence, communication between police and community partners used to be rapid and as open as legally possible. 
Community groups can help find missing pieces in an investigation, sometimes faster than the police, but also must be given the independence to not be seen as having been co-opted by police. That also means accepting that when a survivor would prefer not to work with police, that community organizations honor that request. Prevention strategies can't center upon policing alone, however, and must be based upon community needs and driven by community leadership. That lesson applies just as much to trans-serving organizations as it does to police departments. So shifting gears, how do we get to where we're trying to go? And the answer to that is really, really carefully. Um, so first, I want to explain to you just a quick look at a peace building framework, which looks a lot more complicated than it is. So this was designed by a guy named John Paul Lederach. He's a conflict resolution theorist up at Notre Dame University. And he posits that conflict exists at the intersection of these three blue bubbles, um, which is, represent the nexus of the past towards your left, the future, which is the bubble to the right, and the issues and systems that perpetuate situations in both. And that's the bubble that goes vertically. Since our lived experience with systems, issues, and individual people changes continuously, conflict itself is continuously evolving and shifting. So every day you go along, the vertical bubble is above your head, past and behind you, and the future is in front of you. Up in these sort of corner areas, we're talking about how do we change the future situation in a permanent and lasting way, at the same time dealing with the past and all that came with it. So. This is where I want to spend a good bit of time on crafting a political strategy. Uh, our work here in DC has been highly political, not just um, seeking small things or seeking big, big change. So this is a strategy pyramid. And I'll be honest, I adapted it from a military theorist. But um, improving interactions with police is going to be a tricky path. And this framework is going to help you um, design your approach for change. So up at the top level, that's called policy, also probably known in, as a vision. Um, for example, you probably want a local police department that consistently treats trans people with respect, is competent to interact with trans people appropriately, and addresses crime against trans people with the same urgency as with any other case actively engages with trans community, and is accountable when things go wrong. So up the top, what you want. Grand strategy. That's the whole toolbox you're going to pull out to achieve your vision. Depending on the situation, that could include legislative advocacy, grassroots mobilization, direct interactions with your mayor or your police chief, and or a communications and media campaign to generate a public understanding of why you're seeking that goal. So most likely it's going to be a little bit of all of that. So that's all your toolkit. You're then going to develop strategies for using each of your tools. And for instance, your communication strategy is probably going to center around rallying support around social media or it may center around using mainstream news media to tell the story of why your goal is important. But in any case, you're looking at each individual tool and how you use it as a strategy. The operations bit drills down even further. Taking the communications example, you may decide that you're going to primarily use Twitter and Instagram to reach your desired audience using brief statements and pictures to tell a story that supports your vision and generate buzz around it. Basically, operations are your plan. Um, they're getting a little bit nitty grittier. And then at the very bottom level is tactics. And those are the everyday decisions you're going to make in support of your vision. That might mean you're going to host a Twitter town hall on Tuesday, a webinar on Wednesday, or something like that. These actions are the smallest part of your big picture, and you need to take on minor adjustments as you move towards your goal. 
The tactics are always acting and reacting in support of everything above it. The important thing to remember here is that you're not going to be working in a vacuum. Your city or police department may be incredibly receptive to your initial ask. And always just ask. That's a good way to start. On the flip side, you may face incredible hostility towards your goal. Your initial assessment of your situation will inform your grand strategy and all that flows from it. These situations are inevitably going to change. Sometimes they're going to change dramatically from day to day or year to year. And you'll need to adapt your approach at the appropriate level as you go along. So what are we really after here? And here I just wanted to point out a few concrete accomplishments that can contribute to your vision. So I'm going to start, though, with a caveat that basically no city that I know of has gotten where it needs to be in this work. There are many, many works in progress at many different stages of development. In D.C., we've learned as we've gone along and that there is no important, no, excuse me, no perfect order for obtaining or mixing any of these ingredients. They're ultimately all mutually reinforcing, so it's best to start with what you can most easily get and build out from there. So into the mixing bowl, policy. There are various cities with policies governing police interactions with trans people. These sh should can cover situations where, where a trans person is an arrestee, but also when a trans person is seeking police assistance. Policies should cover respect for gender identity and expression, including name, pronouns, personal appearance items, and record keeping. In addition, there should be sections on searches, not just pat-downs, uh, transportation, housing, and transfer of information to other agencies. For example, when a city police officer takes an arrestee to a county jail. Ideally, these policies should also include provision for tracking data on response to trans-related cases including hate violence and intimate partner violence, data on trans-involved cases, and data on trans-related police, excuse me, trans-related complaints against police officers. So that's the policy piece. Training piece, rule number one, you cannot simply regurgitate policy to officers and expect it to be followed. This results in policy being ignored. Instead, you need to explain why trans policies or trans-specific training is needed, offer some of the context on trans lives and trans experiences with police as we just did here, and then go into policy or lacking a written policy as practices for trans sensitivity. The training should be community informed and specific to the needs of your area trans community. Keep in mind that using good practices of adult learning, including scenarios, role play, and sharing stories is an important part of making the training successful. If possible, it's good to have a community member and a police officer to design and deliver the training as a team so they can reinforce each other. Communication. So trans community leaders and groups need a designated point of contact within the police department. That person needs to have sufficient authority to make decisions, share information, and have discretion to bump a situation up the chain of command as well as respect from the lower ranks. You should not only communicate when something horrible happens. Instead, communicate regularly through established channels and build rapport with each other. That allows for both ongoing progress and improving overall trans police relationships. The more effective response from both police and community organizations in cases of violence may result from this kind of process. And what I want to advocate here is that you're not necessarily seeking the highest level person. You're seeking a good mid-level person can make things happen both above and below them in a hierarchical system. Next on your list is a culture of accountability. That doesn't mean that everybody is filing an onslaught of formal, formal complaints against officers, though in some extreme cases they could. What this really means is that when Officer John says to Officer Bob something offensive like all trans women are liars who walk the streets, Officer Bob makes it clear that Officer John is out of line. If Officer John continues to act out, the department should have the means to deal with his behavior. Independent oversight. Many cities have an independent police monitor or inspector general or complaints office, and these are important tools to make sure that police services are consistently and justly provided. 
Whether or not such an office exists, the local government uh, council or commission should at least annually review the police agency's performance, including relations with trans, lesbian, gay, and bi, and other marginalized communities as part of that discussion. This is a transparency tool, it's not a punishment tool. Community groups and members as well have a role to play in holding police accountable, especially in instances of wrongdoing. Coalition. There's a lot of conversation going on nationally right now about police. Many agendas are being advanced, some that complement each other, and some that could benefit from better coordination. Coalition building helps organize you to lift all boats and has the added benefit of increasing your chances of success, even if, some in some cases, coalition work means success takes longer to achieve. Finally, patience, and this is one that I've had to learn. Um, often trans community leaders and police leaders come from incredibly different backgrounds and have a dramatically different perspective on tackling these issues. If you can go to your police chief and get everything you want, which is a nice smile and a handy memo, Congratulations to you. But more often than not, this will be an ongoing set of negotiations, complete with moments of total frustration for both sides and moments of real celebration. Further, implementation of all of the above is the real challenge. And you can, can't just wait to see that your department adopts a training curriculum or a policy and just walk away. You have to stick around for several years and make sure that the key the transformation you seek is actually taking place. So now we're going to shift again to look at a few brief examples of how some different cities have addressed the questions of trans interactions with police. Note that these are all from large urban areas, but that's in no way to suggest that the work on these issues happens only in big cities. That's just where I focus my own research and environmental scanning as it is most relevant to our experience here in D.C. We're going to look briefly at New Orleans, New York, and Los Angeles. But this work has happened in many other cities as well, including Atlanta, Chicago, Denver, San Francisco, Seattle, and many, many more. So first, New Orleans. Um, an organization down there called uh, Breakout is a youth-led LGBTQ and trans organization that has run a multi-year We Deserve Better campaign related to the New Orleans Police Department. They've done so much work here, it's impossible to tell it all, but a few highlights. Um, Breakout is led primarily by youth of color, aimed at fighting criminalization and school-to-prison pipeline issues. Their work got started as the Department of Justice was investigating the New Orleans Police Department, and they're organizing led to the landmark inclusion of trans and sex worker profiling for the first time in a federal investigation of a police department. Mandates to improve treatment of trans and LGBT people were included in the 2012 consent decree, excuse me, consent decree that the Department of Justice and the New Orleans Police Department signed. Breakout then produced a 10-minute training video for use at police department roll calls sharing stories of interactions with police and offering alternative approaches. Their work also led to the adoption of New Orleans Police Policy 402, which governs police interactions with trans and LGBT people. Breakout members have created some really awesome Know Your Rights guides and postcards to the members. Be one of those postcards up here. And then other efforts that they have worked with include partnering with youth, human rights, and racial justice organizations, both locally and nationally, to offer testimony before the New Orleans City Council. And just a couple of weeks ago, Breakout issued release of their survey project on police harassment with a report also called We Deserve Better, which you should check out. And I believe we'll have a link to share with you later. So moving on to New York, and not all these cities are New City, so it's a nice thing. So in New York, this is just a tiny, tiny, tiny snapshot of trans police relations, and we don't have all day to talk about that. Um, trans advocates and LGBT anti-violence organizations argued successfully for a revision of the New York Police Department's patrol guide with a number of trans-related provisions that were issued in June 2012. 
Bear in mind, the New York Police Department is the largest law enforcement department in the country. Um, these same organizations joined the broader Communities United for Police Reform Coalition that brought together dozens of groups in early 2012 to end the um, racist deployment of stop and frisk procedures and actively sought to call attention to profiling of trans people and LGBT people of color in particular. Communities United for Police Reform advanced something called the Community Safety Act to create an independent inspector general for the New York police monitoring racial and other forms of profiling. Uh, alongside the passage of the act by the city council, the, uh, a federal court case called Floyd versus the city of New York advanced in the court with a 200-page ruling finding racial profiling that undergirds stop and frisk as unconstitutional and mandating four remedial efforts, a court-appointed monitor in addition to the independent inspector general, um, immediate reforms of training, citation forms, and policy, a joint community and NYPD mediation process, and a pilot of body-worn cameras on police officers. Mayor Bill de Blasio has agreed to comply with the provisions of the Floyd ruling and also enforce the Community Safety Act. Um, and the new New York Police Inspector General was formerly in that same job here in Washington. Meanwhile, trans advocates have also secured some advances on the NYPD's use of condoms as evidence of sex work, getting NYPD to agree to, to not use carrying condoms as grounds for prostitution arrest in most cases. Uh, there is also some considerable activism around overall police response to trans hate violence, particularly in the rash of trans murders seen in New York City in summer 2013. So now, Los Angeles. Um, here, this was a little bit more of a collaborative process, um, but there the City uh, Human Relations Commission created a transgender working group in 2007 to investigate in particular, um, police interactions with trans people. They issued a report of their findings from a survey and community forums in 2010 and made several policy recommendations for the LAPD. This led in April 2012 to the adoption of a trans interaction policy by the Los Angeles Police Department, as well as a trans housing policy for people in custody. This effort also spawned work with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department to create policies for the proper treatment of trans people in the county jail. Right, tomorrow, yeah, I'll take her because I got to take both of them. Yeah, yeah thank you, Doug. If somebody else would like to mute themselves, that would be fabulous. Okay. So moving on to DC because. That's where I live, and that's where I work. Yeah, you mean so, like yeah. Going into a bit of what I'll call ancient history, um, as we embarked upon our current police campaign in 2011, we created this sketch of conflict between trans communities and police from about 2000 um, forward. You know, both of them home, organized, and out the door, so I know he said that the seniors this is Michael. Um, we are all muted, so I'm not sure where the crosstalk is coming in, so um, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'll just keep moving. So um, notice that in this sketch, there's a baseline there where uh, queer and trans people, especially people of color, are not routinely criminalized by agents of the state. Um, as we were getting this together, through 2012, we were actually moving further away from our baseline rather than closer to it. Um, we only have just begun to shift back towards the right direction, we think. Get more into that in a bit. So DC trans activism in the past 20 years is usually dated to the death of Tyra Hunter in 1995. Uh, Tyra Hunter, for those of you who haven't heard of her, was an African-American trans woman who was involved in a car crash. Uh, both the paramedics that responded and emergency room staff that eventually treated her delayed treatment as they taunted her for being trans. The DC coroner ruled that Hunter's death was due to negligence by the paramedics and emergency room personnel. The family sued the city, 
And as part of a major settlement, all fire and emergency medical personnel were ordered to undergo trans-related training program that continues to exist. Meanwhile, both gay men and trans women often reported harassment from police, which led in 2000 to the establishment of the Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit, or GLU, within DC's Metropolitan Police Department. The initial unit was led by a full-time sergeant and had seven members who built relationships across the city and responded to incidents involving LGBT people. The unit responded to trans murders in 2002 and 2003, including a double homicide. This unit stayed largely as was created through 2007 when a new police chief, Kathy Lanier, took over the MPD. Along those lines, the DC Trans Coalition was founded in 2005 to advance trans rights and policy as area trans serving organizations came to believe that it was time for trans inclusion in DC's wide-ranging Human Rights Act. The inclusion of gender identity and expression was added to the Human Rights Act in late 2005. A year later, though, DC adopted a prostitution-free zones law, which lowered the standard of probable cause for sex work related uh, excuse me, sex work related arrests in declared zones. So what does that mean? Um, in June 2007, DCTC held a town hall meeting with many area trans residents who identified improving treatment from police department as their top priority. This led to the adoption of a comprehensive policy on police interactions with trans people, which was the first policy of its kind in the nation, and at least in my opinion, is still the model for policies in other cities. Um, yet while this progress was being made, a community-led study called Move Along found that trans women, particularly trans women of color, were especially susceptible to being profiled as sex workers and subject to harassment and unfounded arrest by police officers. While on one hand, the police department was making efforts to treat trans people with greater respect, its aggressive policing of sex work in particular was actually making trans women feel less safe when interacting. So continuing right along, in mid-2009, Chief Kathy Lanier announced her intention to restructure all of the police department's liaison units, there are four of them, working with different marginalized communities, including the LGBT unit. The total number of full-time officers for that unit was reduced from full eight to four, and the full-time sergeant was replaced with a half-time sergeant who also supervised the Latino liaison unit. At the same time, the liaison units were to be supplemented by affiliate officers who would receive additional training, but would continue to patrol in their regular districts. This led to substantial outcry from DCTC and other allied groups, made worse by the disastrous November 2009 rollout of training for the first group of affiliate officers, where activists were called up the night before and asked if they could come make a presentation on their lunch break. Um, also in 2009, the police department released its first report in several years on hate crime statistics, which is mandated annually by DC law. Uh, but while there were figures for lesbian, gay, and bi-related crime, there was no data on trans crime, despite that being part of the mandate. A supplemental report was released in February 2010 with the trans figures, but it became immediately evident that there was a major gap between the MPD reported cases and the experiences of trans community members. Um, further, via a Freedom of Information Act request, the police department admitted that it wasn't keeping the records on trans-related calls for service that were mandated in its own transgender order. In addition, 2010 saw the creation of the LGBT unit's critical incident team, which consisted of activists from across LGBT communities and service providers in, addition, in an effort to improve communication. So in that framework, community organizations worked together to create a new community-led LGBT officer training program that launched in June 2010. And that was the first good step. However, 2010 also closed with the community dealing with an assault on a trans woman by an off-duty officer, which led to the arrest of the trans woman involved after the reporting officer sergeant refused to process the arrest of the off-duty officer. 
So this may sound like small potatoes, but it's about to get bad. So um, the relations between trans groups and LGBT groups more broadly and the police department continue to deteriorate through 2011 and 2012. In March 2011, BCTC released uh, police department emails obtained from the Freedom of Information Act request documenting failures to apply the trans general order, which was caught by the officials of the D.C. jail, and included an admonition by the then mayor to keep the story out of the press. However, some improvement continued as to be noted as trainings kept happening and the critical incident team began working on communications protocols. However, then all broke down on July 21st, 2011, when a young woman named Lachey McLean was murdered in Northeast D.C. All the as-yet untested communications plans broke down. Indeed, local LGBT newspapers had published McLean's name and identity several hours before the police department was aware of it. Um, activists were left clueless as the investigation continued. And then, on top of that, in August 2011, another off-duty officer named Kenneth Furr assaulted a group of trans women and gay men at a local pharmacy. There was a detail officer there working security, and he overlooked Furr's discretion knowing he was a fellow officer. Yet a few hours later, Kenneth Furr crashed his vehicle in that, into that of the group from the pharmacy, which he had been following across town, climbed onto the hood of their car, and fired five rounds into the vehicle, injuring three people. Adding on to that, there was another murder of a trans woman in September 2011, and again in February 2012. That last homicide led to the first arrest of a suspect in a trans murder in D.C. in over a decade. In response to this violence and for what was seen as a poor police response, ECTC held a day of action on November 17, 2011. Also that fall, we requested mediation through the Department of Justice Community Relations Service, a request that MPD ignored. And for those of you that don't don't know this already, the Community Relations Service is sort of a, a non-attorney function of the Department of Justice, and they mediate um, difficulties between civil rights groups and police agencies. Our goal with pursuing mediation was to turn around a situation that was rapidly going south. Face-to-face -face meetings with the chief were tense and usually fruitless. Face-to-face -face meetings with lower-level officials in MPD were equally productive. Um, for many months, we kept our mediation request confidential, but after five months of no response, we testified before, about our efforts before the D.C. City Council in February 2012 at their annual oversight hearing. The summer of 2012, then, was pretty quiet in terms of anti-trans violence but relations between MPD and trans activists continued to remain tense. That summer, Chief Lanier told a meeting of LGBT activists that she had commissioned the Anti-Defamation League to lead a study of how MPD responds to hate crimes and the nature of MPD's relations with LGBTQ communities here in D.C. The ADL, which had played a leading role in um, shepherding the uh, Matthew Shepard, James Bird Hate Crimes Act through Congress, um, began meeting with local activists for individual interviews. Those continued throughout 2012. So in 2013, we enter really a period of political maneuvering. Um, local trans activists, myself included, were always skeptical of the ADL-led team's investigation of MPD, especially its heavy reliance on national LGBT groups for expertise with only a limited role for involvement by local activists. The lack of a written mandate for the review team didn't help it either. Then in early 2013, we received the results of yet another Freedom of Information Act request on Chief Lanier's emails between the um, leader of the ADL team. That request revealed that the group the leader had a personal friendship with Chief Lemire, and at one point, on an evening following a D.C. Council hearing on hate crimes, wrote to Lanier the two sentences seen on the screen here. Wouldn't worry, the only people who don't like you have outstanding warrants. Um, our worst fears then about this supposedly unbiased external review process seem true. 
um, we released these messages to the DC Council and the media in February 2013, just a few weeks after the ADL's first of four town halls for their review project. The first town hall had over 40 attendees. The later three barely garnered half a dozen each. The community has lost faith in the process. That said, both MPD's uh, LGBT liaison unit staff and activists seem content to leave the larger questions aside for a while, focusing more on tangible efforts like moving the trainings to better times and locations, um, and continuing to increase the number of officers trained, which we were already by that point reaching about 300 people, um, and then reconstituting the critical incident team as a new violence prevention and response team seeking out a clearer mandate and getting those communications protocols set up once and for all. So that leads us to where we are today. Um, you know, I mentioned we were skeptical of the ADL process. And when we got those emails, we, we had to come to a quick decision. Do we try to shut this process down? Or do we try to just make it so it's impossible for them to come out and say anything that we wouldn't already agree with? We figured either way would be OK. Um, and so we ended up with the latter. The ADL-led team um, issued what is called the Report of the Hate Crimes Assessment Task Force in late February of this year, um, along with the police department's response. Um, the police department accepted just about every recommendation the task force made. Um, a community response report authored by DCTC and signed by six other local organizations uh, was released two weeks later. Then in April, we sat down with the police department in a space that looks very much like NASA mission control. And the police department agreed to um, accept as well most of the community response recommendations. So the ADL report noted that MPD's relationship with trans communities was disastrous and recommended immediate action to build trust. Indeed, it was this situation that was identified as the root of MPD's broader difficulties with broader LGBT communities. Both MPD and the responding community groups largely agree with the team's findings um, in spite of our earlier reservations. Um, altogether, the ADL team made over 30 specific recommendations, and community groups added to those, bringing the total number to a high 57 bottle of ketchup. Um, so working to implement the recommendations was then kicked off in April, as I mentioned. Um, so far, we're making progress on a number of fronts. Um, the violence prevention and response team is focused on overseeing development of a new training initiative that will see all 4,000 of MPD's officers trained on LGBTQ competency issues in calendar year 2015. That means running three classes a week for 50 weeks at the Police Academy. A working group was put in place to review MPD response to LGBTQ um, intimate partner violence, which makes up some 80% of all LGBT-related calls here to the police. As well as Relevant policies have been revised and are in the process of being implemented. Uh, another working group on the policing of sex work has been created, exploring MPD adoption of what's called the Merseyside model, which is a place in the United Kingdom, um, which means that police place sex work enforcement as the lowest possible priority. And when a sex worker has been attacked, they focus on the attack and not the underlying activity. On the legislative front, the DC Council just a couple weeks ago repealed the problematic and, according to the city's attorneys, unconstitutional prostitution free zones, which have been suspended since early 2012. Um, there's also a bill moving through the DC Council to strengthen DC's independent office of police complaints, and we expect additional legislation on that in the coming year. But before I wrap up, I want to point out that what's been unique here in DC's case is that LGBTQ communities broadly had issues with the police department for years. But it was the leadership of trans people and trans organizations and a crisis of violence against trans people that led to our current moment. The process we're undergoing with MPD 
is going to take many years to implement. I would estimate 20 to 30. Um, and it is incredibly fragile. I mean, not a week goes by, I don't get a phone call from some local colleague saying, I don't trust these people, I don't think they're going to deliver, I don't think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. That keeps happening. Um, as you can imagine, these relationships, like I pointed out in the conflict map, are incredibly strained by past baggage. Um, so we're trying to move forward cautiously optimistic, um, hopeful that we're embarking on something really new, which is the holistic transformation of police departments that's never really been tried before. Um, we're also, as we see the growing movement by uh, D.C. Ferguson and a resurgence of racial justice groups focusing on policing here in D.C., that we're going to be able to grow this coalition even bigger than it already is. In short, what we're doing is going beyond the sort of surface layer level of work in terms of policy or training or what have you. What we're trying to do is change the culture of the police department. I'm going to tell you, sometimes this work keeps me up at night, it keeps me fit. But I also think that we're in a good place and that we're in a hopeful position. So that's the DC story, and I'm sorry it was so long and so historical, but I hope that it sheds light on some of how these things can go very well and go very wrong, all in the same story. So before we conclude, I just want to touch on a number of different sort of laws, legislative framework that can be helpful as you go about this work. Um, so just a brief look at that right, to work them out. Great. There we go. So, <laughs> legislative context. Um, first, remember that in the past few years, um, trans-related protections have been included in both the Federal Hate Crimes Act and the Violence Against Women Act, which deals a lot with domestic violence. These laws spell out guidelines on police response, data collection, and federal oversight, in some cases, federal prosecution. Um, Next, having a trans-inclusive state or local human rights act or non-discrimination law also helps in creating the legal framework to support your efforts with police. In DC, we've advocated for trans-inclusive policies at a number of agencies, police departments, jail, Department of Motor Vehicles, the health department, the insurance regulator, on and on and on. In each case, our justification has been that because gender identity and expression is a protected class, various government agencies need to ensure that their work enshrines that protection. Next, um, some cities, as we mentioned, have independent offices that take police complaints, track data, or monitor police activities. It's good to understand what authorities these offices have, as they tend to be wildly different from place to place. Um, in D.C., we have an Office of Police Complaints. New, York, New Orleans has an independent police monitor. And New York, as I mentioned, has the independent inspector general, which only just got operating about six months ago. Um, depending on the context, a body of complaints can be used to drive change. So for instance, in D.C., the Office of Police Complaints can launch investigations of broad practices within the police department if um, they receive a certain body of complaints of a consistent theme. In other cities like New York, the Inspector General has the authority to proactively investigate potential issues within the police department. Um, that's an authority we'd like to have here, but we don't have it here yet. Um, you also heard me mention several times the Freedom of Information Act, which exists in most cases at the federal, state, and local level. Um, it's important to remember here that all government correspondence, or almost all, is a matter of public record. Um, if your police department is being uncooperative with sharing information, start filing those FOIA requests. Usually a nonprofit organization can get a waiver of the fees so long as the records uh, thought are being used for the public good. It's also a great project to um, involve a legal intern or a volunteer lawyer. Um, we have a great attorney who helps us with those requests. Um, 
he writes them so they cannot be denied, and we get um, often thousands of pages of data back um, in each case. Finally, um, bear in mind our earliest point that gender and sexuality have been policed for hundreds of years. There may be laws on the books that police can use that actively perpetuate poor relations between trans communities and police. Some cities still charge people under uh, crime against nature laws, even though the Supreme Court found those unconstitutional over a decade ago now. In DC, we were able to turn the tide on prostitution free zones by the showing that declaring a zone actually pushed trans women into less safe areas where they were then often attacked. Um, the fact that the city's attorney general found them unconstitutional is really just an added bonus that we didn't quite expect. Um, so keep digging around for those laws. Again, it's a good project for a legal intern or um, volunteer attorney if you have one. Um, because any progress you make is going to be constrained by something that's already on the book. Um, so just think about that. So then to help you find examples, just last Friday, something called the Get Your Rights Network was launched. And this is a terrific new resource um, aimed at combating the uh, criminalization of LGBTQ youth across the country. It was it's being organized by Breakout in New Orleans and a group called Streetwise and Safe in New York City, uh, both terrific organizations. Um, on this site, you have an interactive map, and you can find uh, police policies, uh, know your rights materials, research reports. Um, buttons, tools, graphics, all sorts of awesome things, and developing training curricula as well to help you um, work with police departments and the jail. Um, the DC Trans Coalition is a proud founding member of the Get Your Rights Network, and I hope you'll check it out. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to respond to a question that um, Forge asked me as we got ready for this presentation. Um, and they asked, what are some examples of a city that has done this right? Um, and as I mentioned before, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's reached the end of the road. Um, there are many, 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 too many to count, um, good efforts that are taking place across the country. But really, everybody is dealing with a work in progress. Um, police reform, police accountability work is getting new life, as we're seeing, and we're making headway, but nobody's quite there yet. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Michael. Great. Thank you, Jason. That was really um, interesting. I think a lot of us haven't heard um, many of those stories that you shared with us, and I think it gives people a really good background about what's happened and kind of the state of where we are and how we get to a better place. So that was really um, interesting. So I know that Katie's been monitoring the question area, and um, if she would like to unmute and maybe share one of the first questions that folks have. And if you have questions, feel free to just type in that question area, and Katie will um, read them out loud, because we do have everybody else muted, which makes things a little bit easier on this end. So Katie, do we have question number one? And you may need to unmute yourself from the, the panel. Can you hear me now? There you go. OK, wonderful. <laughs> I had myself triple muted over here. OK, um, it looks like we have a couple questions that are rolling in as of just the past 30 seconds. But um, I'm going to try and address this one that came in earlier on in the webinar. Uh, do you have any trans-friendly policy example guides to share with us? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we will have, um, I think Michael was updating the website to include some policies that I've sent over. Um, the New Orleans one I have, the LA one I have, the DC one of course they have. The New York one is buried throughout a broader document. So I don't actually have a copy of it, but I'm hoping we can find it. Um, 
So in addition to having that on the FORGE website, the same website where you register for this webinar, um, do check out the Get Your Right Network, um, getyrright.org. They're adding to their collection of policies almost daily. So check those out. You'll see them pop up on the map. And this is Michael. I just wanted to pipe in that those resources that um, Jason was talking about are already on the Forge website. So there's hyperlinks to um, all of them, and there's a lot of them. So they're really cool, really neat. Oh, fantastic. OK. Um, the next question, are there currently any provisions in VAWA that extend to trans women? Uh, this is going to be one of those minutes, moments when I wish Lori was on the phone. Well, I can probably <laughs> talk to it as well, Jason, if you'd, if you'd like me to. I'm not a federal expert, so take it, Michael. I'm um, sure. So um, VAWA's uh, non-discrimination pr provisions, when um, it was signed into, um, it was reauthorized in 2013, do offer protections uh, based on gender identity and sexual orientation. So basically, does it, does it extend to trans women? Yes. Does it extend to trans men? Yes. Does it extend to anybody that's trans in any way? The answer is yes. So hopefully that's a short, short answer to that question. Okay, great. All right, next question. Uh, so can you please share the URL for Get Your Rights website? Yes, it's getyrrights.org, and I think it's going to be on that resource page that Michael's talked about already. Okay, great. Okay, this question, do you have any statistics regarding police slash trans activity on university campuses? I don't. Are you talking about university police or, uh, um, but I, I don't think I've seen data on that. Um, you know, this is not an area that has been researched from a statistical perspective uh, very deeply. Uh, we're, we've seen a few reports um, from different cities, but I don't know of a report from a campus. OK. And that person hasn't, hasn't really gone into a whole lot more detail with their questions. So, um, as of this moment, I believe those are all the questions that we have specifically relating to this particular topic. Okay. So if folks have additional questions, we definitely have um, an ample amount of time. We're able to stop early, obviously, but um, we do have an additional 20 minutes or so. So if folks have questions, now's a great time. Uh, well, while we have a couple more roll in, I just want to also plug the uh, National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, which I know was collaborated with Forge before. Um, and they release a lot of data on both hate violence and intimate partner violence nationally um, that, that affects trans people. So do check that out. Um, and I know they're beginning to um, look at police violence in a deeper way and problems with police. So do check them out as well. Great. Thank you. There's one question that came in while you were speaking. Are there policies and laws that create distinctions made and defined between domestic violence versus a hate crime? Um, here in DC, those are separate laws. So um, we have a Hate Crimes Act, which includes gender identity and expression, as well as sexual orientation as protected classes. Um, in DC, that came out of the Human Rights Act. Um, when the Human Rights Act was revised, the DC Council was very good about sort of cleaning house and adding those protected classes to everywhere else where they're mentioned in the law. Um, so that was uh, included almost automatically. Um, intimate partner violence is a different subject. Um, there are cases where um, we have seen something be both domestic violence and hate violence. Um, all in one case. So in D.C., that means um, you're charged with, say, a domestic violence assault, and then um, 
a hate crime enhancement is added to that. So in D.C. and a lot of other places, I think D.C. and the federal law, a hate crime enhancement is, is an additional penalty um, for prosecution. So it's not a separate charge, but it means that in D.C. anyway, you could be sentenced to one and a half times the maximum allowable sentence under the regular statute. Um, but in terms of police response, they are governed by two separate policies. One thing that's been interesting in D.C., though, is that um, particularly in gay and lesbian relationships, um, we've seen increased numbers of dual arrests. Um, D.C.'s domestic violence law mandates an arrest any time the police are called and an assault has taken place. Um, somebody has to go to jail. Um, in a lot of cases, particularly for gay and lesbian folks, but to some extent also cases involving trans people, um, officers have difficulty figuring out who is the primary aggressor, and so they arrest both parties. Um, that, of course, leads to further trauma and victimization for the survivor of that attack. Um, so that's one of the areas we train around, is identifying um, primary aggressors and also identifying when uh, domestic violence is also hate violence. And Jason, can I just uh, jump in with a maybe a secondary question or, or comment, which is around national like hate crimes laws, so the Shepherd Bird Act versus the, the state level or even lower level things. So I think that sometimes it's really confusing to me and I think to others about you know when is it a hate crime? When, when is there a hate crime enhancer? Um, and are those state specific or when did the feds get involved in terms of the Shepherd Bird Act? Do you have anything to offer in addition to that? Uh, yes. Um, in D.C., it's tricky because we're more colony than state, so we don't have our own independent prosecutor. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia prosecutes both federal and local cases. Um, but the Shepherd Bird Act specifies that um, state law comes first. And if a case has not been... Um, prosecuted as a hate crime, and the U.S. attorney in the area believes that it should be, or um, in cases where a state or a locality does not have a hate crimes law at all, the U.S. attorney can step in and prosecute that case in a federal court. Um, but in general, if it happens, if it's a, not usually a federal case, as most violence is not, um, State, state courts have the first jurisdiction. It's only if the U.S. attorney in a jurisdiction where there is no hate, hate crime statute or believes that the hate crime statute is not being followed and should be that the U.S. attorney can step in and prosecute. Thanks for clarifying that. I will also add that I'm not an attorney, so that's not legal advice, so please don't take it with you. Um, <laughs> Okay, we have an interesting question here about uh, the makeup of the police department. So what is known about diversity of the police department and violation of rights of transgender residents? So for example, if a police department's demographics reflect the community demographics, uh, racial, gender, and other demographics, does that police department likely have more helpful and less harmful relationships with trans residents? You know, I wish there were some really terrific, like, social scientist grad students on the call, um, because there's some really great research questions here. Um, again, I don't know if that kind of analysis has been done. I haven't seen anything like it. Um, in D.C., the uh, police department issues an annual report, and that includes a report on the diversity of the force. Um, what we found is that, in general, at least in terms of racial makeup, the police department is roughly reflective of D.C. itself. Um, there is also a better than average representation of women on the force. Um, the force is led largely by women, but still not necessarily reflective. Um, I only know of two trans officers on the force. One is a sergeant who transitioned last summer on the job, and the other is um, a new recruit who I don't think has even been sworn in yet. 
So um, in that case, we estimate that you know probably a, a few percent at least of the police department, of, excuse me, of the city is made up of trans folks. Haven't actually gotten there yet in terms of um, of police representation. You may find some data on that in on the area of racial justice and looking at racial profiling, and you can usually make correlations or assessments by looking at that, patterns tend to follow. Um, but trans-specific or LGBT-specific, I don't think exists. OK. Uh, in states uh, you have worked with that have trans policies, is hate crime policy integrated into those policies? Or have you seen them as separate policies? Uh, usually, I think they're separate. So I know the DC police has a general order on interacting with trans people. They have a separate, uh, I think it's called a special order on dealing with hate crimes. And they have a separate standing order, I think it's called, on dealing with intimate partner violence. Um, in addition, and I know I've mentioned this throughout, but there's a separate order still on dealing with sex work policing. So oftentimes these are separate documents. It tends to be because hate crimes laws in particular are more inclusive um, of different classes, whereas um, with LGBT or trans policies, you're getting a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. OK, so the next. Three questions are related to um, are related to jails and prisons, and so I'm not exactly sure if this is the right form, but I'm going to start, and, and I'll let you make that determination. Um, so the first person is asking, what is the population in most jails? And I'm and I'm assuming um, the follow-up question to that, related to that, will help clarify what is the appropriate way to determine where to house. Uh, trans folks or LGBTQ folks in jail? <laughs> um, all y'all want data. Um, <laughs> can I? I have a quick data on that once it's in my head. Um, OK. Mm -hmm. So the, the NCT, the National Center for Transgender Equality, did a study in 2011, uh, over 6,000 respondents. And they found that 15% of trans folks had been in jail at least once. This doesn't like, directly answer the question that's being asked. Um, but when we look at an intersectionality around it, um, of the African American respondents, 47% had been to jail. So that doesn't exactly tell you what's the current population in any specific jail but it kind of gives a, an idea of how many trans folks have been incarcerated at some point in their life. And so there's a, a racial um, you know, division about, about who's um, incarcerated, which is, I think, reflective of general population as well. And mm -hmm. also, um, to piggyback on that, um, in DC, our local study has found that 36% uh, of trans respondents have been in jail or prison for any reason. Of that, 80% of those identified as trans while they were in jail or prison. And just over half of those folks were housed with the wrong gender while they were in jail or prison. Um, statistics from there go on and on. But um, let's see, um, you know, over half were experienced harassment by fellow inmates. Um, and then also, um, about a third experienced harassment from um, corrections officers or staff. So that's mm -hmm. the population question. And I have since forgotten the second half of the question. <laughs> Is that how, how, do you, how do they know where to place folks? Um, and uh, I'm assuming that goes to, to gender identity. Right. So. Um, this is an evolving area of practice. Um, in DC, the DC Depart Department of Corrections has a policy on um, they call it gender classification and housing, um, which is basically the trans policy. 
Um, I will note, though, that because of DC's weird status as not a state, um, DC Corrections Department only houses people serving uh, misdemeanor offenses. So, um, really, the maximum amount of time you'll be in DC jail is a year, but in general, most people don't stay in DC jail longer than three months. From there, you're put in the federal system, which the rules are completely different. But locally, um, there are a few different options. So you're processed in. Um, your arrest papers from the police department should identify you as trans, and the police department is supposed to communicate to corrections that you are at risk. Um, by that, they mean at risk for violence or harassment. Um, so there are a few sort of best practices there. We try to make sure that people are housed um, the, when they're in police custody uh, at sight and sound um, separation from other inmates. Um, when they get to the jail, there are some options. So here locally, um, we have uh, you've processed in. Every uh, person being processed is seen by a housing review committee. Um, for trans folks, if you identify as trans or are identified by the police being trans when you come in, um, you have the option of being of filling out a waiver where you're allowed to express where you believe you can most safely be housed, or you can be seen by a special trans housing committee um, who will review your case. Um, that committee is no different from the regular housing committee, except that it has a trans community activist on it. Um, your options are um, general population male, general population female, um, sort of communal protective custody is what they call it, or solitary. Um, most folks don't choose solitary. In fact, I don't have actual data on it, but anecdotally I've heard that a lot of trans women see, end up choosing general population male just because they know how to navigate it. Um, so, but again, we have options. It's important here just to have options and allow people that ability to sort of self-select where they'll be most safe in their own view. Um, I'm happy to include a link to that policy as well um, for the FORGE website, and it's also on the DCPC website as well as the Get Your Right website. And if I can add just a quick little mm -hmm. um, tidbit, which is not directly related, but it has some really good information. The uh, PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which is mm -hmm. uh, definitely what it, what it sounds like, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, it has some really good guidelines for how to house people, where to house people, and you know it, it's kind of a top-down strategy. So not all uh, police departments or jails or detention centers are going to follow um, some of the sorting or, or where people are placed, but they definitely have recommendations on how places can determine where people should go and and safety is a, a primary issue um, for for where people end up and I'll add that to our list of resources as well and thank you for saying that Michael actually one of the folks um, had made a comment about Priya so it was it was good that you reinforced their their comment That's great. do we have some other questions yeah I think we have one other one potentially two um, how can we as a community and as an LGBTQ activist support an existing LGBTQ police liaison while also making sure that our best interests are in fact being represented? Wow, you've, you've really hit the, the nub of, <laughs> of my life. <laughs> um, that's hard. It's incredibly hard. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of officers that I work with quite closely, quite frequently, and sometimes we just have to agree to disagree. Uh, in, you know, in D.C., there's been, for a number of years, for instance, the police officers weren't getting raises. There was sort of that, we support you from a labor rights perspective, but at the same time, D.C. D.C. has a policy of not advocating for more money for cops for any reason. Um, we, um, we don't support additional funding from these agencies. 
Um, so it's hard because you do have some well-meaning, and I would say these liaison roles, particularly dedicated officers here, um, who are really trying to change a problematic system from within. And you want to support them in that, and you want to be an ally to them in that. But at the same time, you have to manage your own constituencies' needs and your own personal needs here. And that, um, you know, are you reinforcing an oppressive system that's good for your friend, or are you looking for the greater good? Um, when you sort of get into an intermediary role between the broader community and the police department, you find yourself walk, walking a very fine line between, you know, falling too much on the police perspective side or falling too much on the community perspective side. I try to err on the side of the community side, and I'm pretty open. Like, you know, I had a very frank um, conversation with a police official. She's not a sworn officer, but she's pretty high up. Last week, and I was like, listen, some of our deadlines are not being met. Um, some of the commitments to rolling out training for next year don't seem to be working out the way they're supposed to be. Um, you know, I'm going to have to say it's time to move. You know, put up or shut up. And and I said it in writing, and she called me and she said, listen, thank you for that. I know you have to do this. You know what's going on. I said I do know what's going on. And I'm saying you know. I know what you're saying. I know what you're doing. You've given me personally a lot of the excuses in the background situation, but the rest of the community doesn't see that. You know, they don't. The community at large doesn't see the bureaucratic hurdles that have to be jumped in a lot of these things, and they don't care, frankly. They see a problem area that needs to be fixed, and as an activist, you just sort of have to do your best to bridge, and really make judgment calls all the time about where you stick your neck out there. And that sounds like a really good place, um, a little bit depressing, but a good place for us to end, since we're almost at the end of our time. Um, if you've asked other questions, we will do our best to um, have, um, hopefully Jason will be willing to answer them by email, or we'll get it back out to you in some way. Um, or we'll put it back on that resource list as well. So um, I wanted to, to thank all of you for, for being here today and for, for sticking through the, the 90 minutes. And, and definitely thank you, Jason, for all of your really rich knowledge and, and stories and history and, and vision in what you shared with us today. And Katie, thank, thank you, you for um, <laughs> good good stuff. And Katie, thank you for, for feeling, feeling our, our questions today and, and being a really good part of making this a success. So I just wanted to review for folks that we will be sending out the PowerPoint slides tomorrow. We'll have a link to the archived recording as well. It will also have a link to the resource list that we've been talking about, um, which you can easily find on our, our web page right now. Um, so we encourage you to share the, the recording and the resources with people that you think will uh, you know, benefit from them. We also really care about your, your feedback and, and evaluation. So as soon as the webinar closes in just a second, we'll, uh, it should pop up with a, an evaluation for you to fill out. It's a very short survey. Um, so please share your thoughts with us. And we don't have a date yet scheduled for the next webinar, but the, it will be on mental health and therapy and working with transgender survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and stalking. So um, keep that on your radar screen, and we will have a, an announcement out with a registration in the next week or two. So um, we're excited about that. So again, thank you all for, for being here, and thanks, Jason and, and Katie, for being staff on this. <laughs>